Good evening. Welcome to Otaking Seminar. It's November 4th. I've always wanted to try a prank like this, but the problem is, it's hard to breathe. I can't see, and I can't read the lecture note either. Not good. I think they're going to use this clip for the thumbnail, so I must leave it on for at least a minute. The nose keeps moving while I'm talking. I know. I look a bit like Porco the pig, right? I would look exactly like him with the hat. And I happen to be wearing a jacket with a similar color. Halloween is over, so it's a waste of time, really. I think I'll take it off now. Okay, now. Here you go. Let's start, shall we? Uh, okay. All right, this is Nico Nico Live program. Otaking Seminar Porco Rosso was released in 1922. That is 26 years ago. That means people in the mid-20s have never seen it in theaters. But it is sometimes shown in public halls, so you never know. It was made specifically as an in-flight film for the international flights of Japan Airlines. The initial idea was for it to be a 15-minute film, but the filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki was asked to extend it to 30 minutes or 45 minutes by the airline company. But Miyazaki originally planned it to be shorter. It was intended to be an animation for exhausted middle-aged men whose brain cells had turned into tofu. The middle-aged man with tofu brain. It was 1992. Well, you can imagine what flying was like in the 90s. Oh, sorry, not 1922, it's 1992. Back in the 90s, in-flight smoking was allowed. This film was for worn-out middle-aged men traveling to big cities on business who smoked heavily during flights. A copywriter, Shigesato Shige, created an advertising slogan, Cool Personified. It was broadcasted on TV last Friday, so a lot of people may have seen it. If you have never seen it, it might be difficult for you to keep up, but just do your best. I'll talk about this film two weeks in a row. This week, I'll talk about how to get the maximum enjoyment from the film and do a complete breakdown of the first 10 minutes. 9 minutes and 15 seconds to be precise, just like we did in the lecture of The Castle of Cagliostro the other day. There's an extreme sense of euphoria in these first 9 minutes and 10 seconds, and today I could talk for 90 minutes non-stop, or 100 minutes even, so I can go over everything. So it's hard to put a break between the first and second part. So I'll tell you how to fully enjoy the film. Maybe this is a bit misleading, but this animation is sukebe, meaning lecherous or downright horny. Not skebe in respectable Chinese characters, but naked in katakana characters. You know Japanese tabloid newspapers like Tokyo Sports? And you see those middle-aged men reading page 3 of the tabloid newspaper to goggle at on the train. It's kind of like that. This anime is literally saying, this is what it's like to be a middle-aged man. And what's so great about it is that this lecherous mentality is slightly concealed from women and kids. I was looking at the tweets after it being broadcasted, and yes, the viewers don't seem to sense anything lecherous. So tonight, I don't mean to spoil the film, but I'd like to talk about how to fully enjoy the film. At the end of next week's lecture, or the second part, I will lick the plate clean, every bit of it, because there's a complex story behind the film. This week, I'll talk about why the movie set a middle-aged man as the main character, and why he is a pig. Well, son, you'll get it in 20 years' time. Might be answer that the movie has given to the audience. But you know, it's already been 28 years since its release. I guess son has become a middle-aged man himself. So, it's a lecture to ourselves. 
the Middle Age. Next week, it's dig deep and lick clean. This week, it's tips to fully enjoy the film, so stay tuned. What Miyazaki did to make this anime for grown-ups is that he created a shadow for all the characters, but kept it completely hidden. So all the characters seem straightforward, but there's something lonely about them. But he does this skillfully and keeps the audience entertained. He also uses the same tactic in Howl's Moving Castle. This film is like a chocolate parfait. You can enjoy your parfait by just licking the cream on top. And the cream is so delicious that many people are satisfied with it. And most people think that this film is solely made out of cream. But beneath it lies Bavarian cream, coffee flavored jelly, mousse, and even fruit. And you should taste the bitter chocolate as well. This is what we'll be talking about this week. I don't have time to show you all the documents, so I will disclose them separately in the Dokuen channel and the salon. Okay, now I'll explain the first 10 minutes of this film for the entire lecture today, both first and second half. Like I said, this was initially a short film project for international flight to entertain the worn-out middle-aged man. So, Miyazaki intended to make a film that would be like an erotic short comedy if you look at the first 10 minutes. You'll notice that there are loads of puns, although they're not obvious, but they'll gradually dawn on you during this lecture. The first one, well, this is not a pun at all. The pig and the text come up on screen with the sound of a typewriter in the background. From the top, it's Japanese, Italian, Korean, English, Chinese, and Spanish. Spanish wasn't there in the beginning, but it was added later. And that's because these 10 countries were the common roots of the international flights of JAL back then, where Porco Rosso was planned to be played on. Spain was one of their roots as well, but it wasn't in the list earlier, so it was added later. So the subtitles were made based on the roots of international flights. And after the subtitle, you'll see the secret base. Porco's secret base. There's a backstory to it. It was a house for fishermen to shelter from the storms, which Porco inherited. I'm not sure if you could catch fish in a sea as transparent as the Adriatic, but you could see some fishes sold in the fish markets. So maybe you can. So he inherited or bought the house. But the most important subject in this scene is Porco's seaplane. This is a seaplane, not a plane. And this seaplane is tilted and the left float is touching the water surface. You see, Miyazaki is very meticulous. The left hand float is the only section touching the water surface, while most people would probably draw it horizontally. Miyazaki is such a genius that he slightly tilted it. And there's a small boat on the right. Yes, this small boat. In the beginning, I thought this was something he used to go to town with when the seaplane wasn't working. But that wasn't the case. I'll explain that later. Now. There's music in the background. And you see Porco sleeping. I want you to take a look at the color coordination of the towel and the chair. For this piece, the color scheme was not done by Michio Yasuda, who had done all the color schemes for Ghibli's productions before that. But a rookie named Teruyo Tateyama, a pupil of Yasuda's. This is a photo taken at that time at a kind of discussion meeting of the Ghibli female staff. She is a good looking, rather listless woman. And her mentor, Yasuda, who recently died, is said to be the model for Gina. 
She wasn't exquisitely beautiful like Gina. It was just that Yasuda was so good at her work that even Miyazaki couldn't compete with her. For example, if they were discussing which color to use for the gold dust of Ashitaka in Princess Mononoke and Miyazaki says, let's use this color, she would say, of course not, you have terrible taste, this color is a lot better. Even if he insists and says, no, I think this one's better, she'd come right back with, don't be ridiculous, when Miyazaki sees the final draft and says, you were right. Then she would say, I told you, I'm always right, she always wins, just just like that. He couldn't say anything after she'd actually applied the color. She was the master. This piece was done by her pupil and also used meticulous complex colors. The last scene where Porco and Curtis fight, for instance. During that fight scene, there's a moment when they fall into the water and bubbles come out from their mouths. They came up with a wonderful color for the bubbles, but that made Curtis's face stand out. In this scene, Porco's facial expression is more important and they needed to find a color that could make his face more prominent. So they had to compromise and change the color. She actually said that in an interview, for her, nothing happens by accident and it's all calculated. The towel and the deck chair have the same blue stripe design. I think he intentionally matched the color and the design of the deck chair and the towel. They were probably sold off from a luxury hotel or a cruise ship. I think that's why they have the same colors. And you see the bucket here? The bucket has a bottle inside. The bottleneck is a bit wider at the end, so you can tell that it's a bottle of champagne being cooled in a bucket. I think the ice has already melted. I first thought this was a bottle of wine for toasting after beating the Sky Pirates, but in Italy, chilling wine is the stupidest thing to do. You can hear Le Tom de Cerise from the radio. This is one of the theme songs, but I'll leave it for next week because it's a very complex topic. So, Porco is, here you go, sleeping with a magazine called uh, Cinema on his face. On the cover of the magazine, you see the number 1929, so you know this film is set in 1929. And if you read the books on the subject or Wikipedia, they also say that the story takes place in 1929, so that's clear. Later in the film, there's a scene where Porco is supplying fuel and talking to the shopkeeper and says, ah, the world depression. The world depression starts October 1929, but this story takes place in the summer, and so it doesn't make sense. Some people say this film is set in 1930 or in 1933, and the reason why there are two different theories is because later in the film, when Porco goes to buy a machine gun, he is offered to buy the patriotic national debt by the postman or the banker. And in Italy, the patriotic bond was only issued in 1930 and 1933, so some people assume that the story takes place in one of these years. I personally think, or I take a stance that it was set around 1930. In the official book, it also says it is set at the end of 1920s, and as the year 2000 is included in the 20th century in decimal arithmetic, 1930 can be included in the 1920s. Anyway, I think it's around that time. Also, the World Depression happened in October 1929. It took about a year to reach Italy, which was already depressed, and it made things much worse. So considering that history, I think 1930 makes more sense. I want everybody to take a look at the tie he's wearing. Yes, he's wearing a tie, and you may wonder why. But I'll talk about this later. And then the phone rings. Ring, ring, and you hear a voice that says, Porco, it's not good. But this is strange when you think about it. There couldn't have been an underwater cable, and he couldn't have had an antenna for a wireless phone. 
I'll tell you how phones work. I knew a taxi driver who worked at a phone office. I once got into a conversation with him, and this is the story he told me. You turn the handles when you use the old hand crank phones. That very act of cranking was actually generating electricity. And where does this electricity go? Well, definitely not to your phone. The electricity is connected with the telephone operator. It's connected to the operator far away from you. And if you turn the handles, the bell in front of your operator rings and the lamp turns on. And then the operator will answer the phone and say, who do you want to talk to? And you'll tell them the number. And the operator will press the numbers to ring the person at the other end. Then the button that the operator presses generates electricity, travels and rings the phone at the other end of the line of the receiver's house. Then the bell rings. So, what this means is that the phone in this era did not have any battery in it. So, it's either you generate the electricity and ring the phone on the other side, or the caller generates electricity and rings yours. So, if Porco's phone rings, it means that the electricity was sent from the other end, where the operator generated it remotely. And so, you'd wonder if there was an underwater cable at that time, but nobody could answer that. Let me know if anyone knows the answer. By the way, the taxi driver who used to work at the telephone office was already over 70 when I met him. I assume that the phones in Gina's hotel went through the radio base station in that island. But I wonder how Porco's phone worked. The person on the phone says, Porco Rosso, fly immediately. Mama Yuto is here. And then, let's see, this is it. Porco picks up the phone, listens to it while lying down, and uses his feet to move his desk towards him. It's a great scene, and I want you to take note of his gloves. He even has a tie. Don't you think it's a bit odd? You'd think that he's very passionate about his work, but he only says, Mama Yuto, I don't work for low wages. But you see, he moves the desk towards him and turns off the radio to get down to work. So he's already motivated to get to work. Like I said, he's wearing a proper combat uniform, well, a pilot uniform and a tie, and he's even wearing gloves. He's fully geared up. The question is, does he wear this all the time? You'd think that he's the kind of guy who's always fully geared up, always ready, but that is not the case. You'll see what he usually dresses like later on in the film. <laughs> this is what he wears every day. <laughs> Tank top and shorts. That's all he wears every day. It's kind of obvious. So, in this first scene, at the very first scene, Porco already knows about the order. He knows he will receive a call soon and be ordered to prepare for the attack. That's why he's already geared up for his work wearing a tie and gloves. For whatever reason, he even has champagne, chilled, ready to drink. The phone call was a lot later than he had expected, so he fell asleep. That's the real story behind this scene. Keep this in mind, because it's useful for later. Like I said, Porco even has his gloves on. The person on the phone says, the charter ship that left Venice is being targeted. It carries salaries for the mine bank. 
Is that all? asked Porco. The caller first sounds a bit reluctant to answer, but tells him that there are also young female students who are on a vacation tour on board. Porco smirks and says, Well, you gotta pay me more then. He looks so delighted. He was waiting for him to say it, apparently. There is a reason why Porco was fully geared up with his combat uniform, tie, and gloves, and champagne. Actually, there are a few reasons. For example, there might have been a spy among Mama Yuto, and he was informed about this attack beforehand. Second possibility, he was intercepting SOS radio calls. So, he knew from the moment when the charter ship sent SOS from Venice. Third, some affiliate of Porco's was inside the organization that requested for an attack. Fourth, he knew that a group as stupid and poor as Mama Yuto would plan an attack soon. Well, these are the standard possibilities you could think of, but here's my theory. This charter ship carries a huge amount of money. I mean, they are salaries for the mine company. It is a huge amount of money. And of course, the female students. Porco presumes that they are female students from universities, considering that they are on vacation. He knew they were on the ship, and that the ship would be targeted by Mama Yuto. A ship carrying a huge amount of money, plus the girls. Why wouldn't they attack? Of course they would. So, he gets fully geared up to be ready to attack as soon as they call. Just get rid of Mama Yuto fast and save the girls, who will be impressed by this amazing gentleman who saved their lives. He'll then say, this is our hiding place. Let's make a toast, just the two of us. I think that's what he was planning. And that's why this towel here, now you know what I mean. It's there for that particular reason. Otherwise, it's totally redundant. Why does he need it there? I mean, he's sitting on a deck chair. So the champagne is for toasting after destroying the Sky Pirates. The girl would say, The beach here is so beautiful, and your secret base is so amazing. I want to take off my clothes and sunbathe. Oh, what a coincidence! There's a towel here. That's what he had in mind. <laughs> so, when you think about all these things, the other scenes turn into something different. If I think about those things, well, I first thought that this small boat was there for him to use when the seaplane wasn't working, so he could go and get help. But, I think it was intentionally pulled up on the beach for a girl. He'd say, the stars are amazing here, and keep her till night. And when you look at the background, there's a house with a window and a door. Did you all notice? There's a house inside Porco's secret base. Uh, which one is the best? Maybe this. Ah, uh, this one. This one is the best, I guess. So, there's a house with a window and a door. Now then, why a tent when he already has a house? That's because he doesn't want the girls to see his filthy house. So, he prepared a tent and a kerosene lamp to make it romantic. But, they were eventually used by Fio Piccolo. Poor guy. That's the real story behind the scene. What I mean by this is the real story is that before Miyazaki even made this film, he drew a manga in a model magazine called Hiko Teijidai, meaning the era of a seaplane, which is the basis of this film. In that manga, right from the outset, Mama Yuto kidnaps a beautiful girl like Clarice in the castle of Cagliostro, apparently a university student. So, Porco goes and rescues the girl who has been kidnapped. Then, he happens to pass a sightseeing airship. And the airship happens to be carrying many young girls. As he passes the airship, the young girls all cheer and say, 
Look, it's a pig. He's so cute. But Porco responds calmly by saying, the whole airship might be kidnapped if you don't be careful. And he blows a kiss. You can see a heart drawn here. So he blows a kiss. The girls say, he's so cool. And Porco says, yeah, was his reply. Um, as you can see, the whole scene, it's like a skit of a famous Japanese comedian, Ken Shimura. This was Miyazaki's original plan, an anime to heal the middle-aged man whose brain cells had turned into a tofu. And this sequence is exactly that. It was as simple as that, but the story became more and more serious and the characters became so complex that it turned into a totally different thing. But you can sense his initial plan throughout the first 10 minutes to 15 minutes, which is called part A. So that's why this opening is the best part. And, but there's more. After he goes, hey, 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 hey. Sorry, I just love this part, you know? I'm sure people will attack me online for this. So, finally, Porco Rosso rescues this beautiful girl, but this girl, who had dived into the sea, was completely soaked, so he was worried. In the upper frame, he says, I don't mean this in a lecherous way, but you are soaked and you should take off your clothes. Hang them under the wings and the Adriatic sunshine will dry them instantly. You may be totally naked beneath the blanket, but I'm too busy repairing the engine to notice it. In the lower frame, he says, are they dry? Now, let me take you back to your parents. Oh, there's a problem. This seaplane is only for a single passenger. Why don't you sit on my lap? No choice. Go on now. Porco Rosso now has a beautiful girl who was naked just a few minutes ago on his lap and flies with the setting sun and the sea in the background. This is actually the ending. Isn't it great? In the film, however, who Porco rescues are not college girls, but a group of kindergartners. And because it wasn't something he expected, he gets disappointed and almost collapses, like in another Ken Shimura skit. This is the basic idea underlying the first 10 minutes. You'd imagine something with harmless laughs and some innuendo, but it's a total letdown at the end. It's like the greedy Ryotsu in the manga Kochikame, whose plans are upset. The first 10 minutes is made as a comedy anime. Middle-aged Porco gets caught up in his own fantasies and is let down by the unexpected results. Porco is just like Ryotsu in Kochikame. He too is portrayed as a complete lecherous old man, but he doesn't get the girl. He freezes once he gets the opportunity. So he's similar to Ryotsu in many ways. And when Fio suddenly takes off her clothes and says, I'm going to swim, he can't even say, don't do it. He just says, ah, look, and just freezes. This scene where Fio suddenly takes off her clothes and swims is a kind of repetition of a scene in the first 10 minutes where a girl swims naked. It is like retrieving a hint that was thrown in. Porco is basically a horny pig who is constantly fancying girls. But when Fio actually takes off her clothes, he fidgets and thinks, Oh Christ, no! Not knowing what to do. So, he is like a naive virgin boy. Because of the advertising slogan, cool, personified, people might expect someone cool. But behind this mask, you'll find this naive virgin still in his adolescence. Only a middle-aged man would understand it. If you were still a kid, you'd think, ah, so this is cool. If you're young, you'd look up to this kind of a man. But when you're already middle-aged, you kind of understand his feelings, not being able to lay a finger on a girl and wondering if you're a coward. In manga such as Shonen Weekly Jump magazines, Yuna and the Haunted Hot Springs, We Can't Study, and Young Magazines, What is the Teacher Doing Here? The horny virgin cannot act even when he gets his chance. So the middle-aged men Miyazaki targets are exactly the same as these horny virgins caught up in their erotic fantasies. Like I said, 
Porco Rosso is an anime film for worn out middle aged men whose brain cells have turned into tofu. So, Miyazaki was supposed to do a favor by making this film for the average middle aged men who are looking forward to reading an erotic article of a tabloid newspaper on a commuting train during the rush hour, whether they feel ashamed or not. So, these young nerds in Miyazaki are both delusional virgin types, and they share the same habits, but Miyazaki is a bit more dexterous, and he knows how to hide this side of him from girls. So, we move on to the next scene. While Porco is going <laughs> lost in his own fantasies, the air pirates are working hard. This is the scene where we find out who the female students really are. Dabo Haze lands on the water. Dabo Haze is the name of Mama Yuto's seaplane. Dabo Haze smashes into the water when they make a splashdown. Like, boom! Is there a model of a seaplane? Oh, there it is. I hope it doesn't break. We don't have the exact model of Dabo Haze, so we'll use one with a similar shape. So you see, instead of landing quietly like this, Dabo Haze smashes on the surface of the water like this. Splash! It is said that the German seaplane called Dornier was the model of Dabo Haze. And this Dornier is, I think, a DOJ type. Two engines in front and back. And the wing like extension, called Sponsen, is similar to that of a Dornier. Some people say it's a giant version of a Dornier, but Mama Yuto couldn't have afforded that. I think they modified the neck and made it look like an airship. It has been modified in so many ways that it's hard to imagine the original shape. This sponson under the main wing is the major feature. Sponson is like, so, it's like a short wing with a float that balances the ship when it lands on the water. Mama Yuto always makes a dramatic splashdown by creating a dynamic splash because the sponson causes a ground effect near the water surface. It's called the ground effect. So, for example, the plane's floating power temporarily spikes near the surface. Have you ever seen the human bird contest in Biwa Lake? The people in the gliding category fly right above the water surface. They intentionally maintain low altitude so that they can utilize the ground effect. If you fly about a meter above the water surface, a drone of that size that you see in Biwa Lake, oh sorry, not a drone, a glider, can easily fly by using the ground effect. If they fly 5 meters or 10 meters above the sea level, they'd lose the ground effect and lose the floating power. Since Dabo Haze's sponson is too big, it generates too much lift. If you have a sponson right close to the water surface, just like this biplane here, it causes the ground effect. So, seaplanes or any biplanes with the wings at the bottom are extremely difficult to land because it causes the ground effect as it gets near the surface. It keeps flying and won't land. There have been many cases where planes lost speed and stalled. So it's always better to smash into the water surface when you land. During World War II, when planes landed on carriers, they didn't land from the side. Instead, they came down from above and almost dropped on the deck. That was another way to avoid the ground effect. So, this type of plane was difficult to land. It tended to float and land further ahead due to the ground effect. So, the pilots intentionally dropped the plane on the water. Mama Yuto might have tried to utilize the resistance from the water to stop right in front of the ship. 
As you can see, Mama Yuto is busy working. Meanwhile, Porco is completely unaware that um, he's about to rescue little kids instead of female students. So, Porco triumphantly gets on his plane, Savoya. He walks along the pier and gets on his plane while avoiding the rear wing. Take a look at these two pictures and compare the two. Look at the propeller next to the cockpit. The propeller on the picture below is very close to the water surface. So the plane sinks as Porco gets on the plane because of his weight and the drought gets deeper. It is a subtle description, but I think Miyazaki does it beautifully. Porco avoids the rear wing because he's too fat and doesn't have enough space to walk. He skillfully maintains his balance to avoid obstacles. This behavior is extremely human. The depiction of the Savoya sinking as Porco steps in captures the physics of the situation. Miyazaki is completely in control of both human element and the physics in this single cut. That's why this scene looks so real. You can see the same level of accuracy in the characters in the anime film in this corner of the world. But in this case, Miyazaki combines the human and the inanimate to great effect. It looks so real that you feel like you want to go there. After Porco gets on the Savoya, he turns the crank handle really fast. You hear a heavy whirring sound, and Porco steps on the lever with his foot to turn on the engine. This handle he's turning is like a gigantic version of a flywheel. It's made of iron or steel. I'm not sure about the material, but basically you turn this flywheel sufficiently until you have enough rotational energy. And then you step on the lever to transfer the energy to the engine. So I guess you could say it's like a manual self-starter in a car. The reason why Porco uses his foot to move the lever is because usually this is an engineer's job, not his. Engineers do that kind of thing, but since he always attacks the air pirates by himself, he's gotten used to being alone. So much so that he has even started using his foot. Maybe he felt frustrated in the beginning, but he must have gotten used to it. The engine starts and releases a huge amount of smoke which chokes him after he fastens his seatbelt. Porco's small propeller begins to rotate. Here. It's the propeller here. The propeller begins to rotate and Porco fastens his seatbelt. In the pre-lecture, I explained that this is a pump that lifts the fuel, but an acquaintance of mine told me, well, the reason why I said it was a windmill type pump is because it says so in this book, Art of Porco Rosso, and it even says windmill type pump in the storyboard, so I simply believed it. But to be precise, this is called a dynamo, a kind of generator. The big propeller rotates and activates the smaller one, like a bicycle dynamo. It generates a tiny amount of energy when rotated by wind. When the electricity surges, it starts the motor in the pump. In other words, you run the motor by lifting the fuel from the fuel tank inside Savoya. Okay. Now, this is the scene I had a hard time understanding myself. Porco pushes the throttle and the engine starts. This is the front, by the way. Porco puts his hand on the throttle and pushes it. You'll see that this is the engine output. But you'll also see that he's using his thumb to move the other lever, beside it with a red bulb on it. On the storyboard, it is described as a timing lever. 
which doesn't really make much sense. Some experts told me that it's probably a mixture control level. I'm not a plain nerd like Miyazaki, so I got the information through SNS. But this is the lever to control the ratio of fuel to air before sending the fuel into the engine. The smoke came out because the fuel ratio was too high. This lever is to lower the amount of fuel to achieve perfect combustion. He pushes the lever to control the fuel ratio. By doing so, the ratio shifts from rich to lean. Maybe the bikers would understand what I'm talking about. But some people say that because this is called the timing lever, it's there to control the timing of the fuel injection. So when the cylinder is moving inside the engine, this lever sets the timing to inject the fuel. It speeds up the process as the rotation of the engine speeds up to prevent knocking. But honestly, I don't know who to believe. So, again, the plane sinks as he gets on it. He turns the handle, kicks the lever, starts the engine, propellers on the side rotate, he opens the throttle and moves the mixture level or the timing lever. This sequence is so fluid and pleasant to watch, and it is so cool. The creators of Mobile Suit Gundam experimented with drawing the behavior of a pilot in a cockpit and came up with various sequences. They were usually something to do with flipping the switches in front of them. They were realistic and well thought out, but not unique enough. Whereas in this scene, Porco uses his whole body. He tunes up the engine and finally opens the throttle at the end in order to increase the output. Everything is so rhythmical. Boom, 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 boom. It's perfect with the music. You know, it's so well made that I think it's as good as the attack scene of Thunderbirds, our go. After he does that, after that windmill rotates, Porco takes the loose rope that moored the ship to the pier and throws it onto the pier just using his left hand. And the way he throws the rope is nice. It's as if he is being careful not to get it wet so that it won't rot. He throws it onto the pier just in from the edge where it won't fall into the water. You can tell that this is one of his daily routines. There's a lot of excitement in it, and I think it's so cool. Anyway, so he finally speeds up. Porco seaplane, Savoya, speeds up and leaves the secret base. You would think that it is going to leave the water and take off in an instant, but it doesn't. It has a hard time taking off. It lifts once, but fails twice. This guy. I think I'll put this aside for now. I only touched it once and one of the pillars is already broken. <laughs> I don't want to touch it too much. The plane doesn't rise at once. Those of you who recorded the film, check again. It rises once but drops twice. And this is the splash when the plane bounces on the water. The reason why it bounces before taking off is because it's a seaplane. A seaplane is basically more a ship than an airplane. It is usually built by the shipwright. Do you remember Mr. Caproni in The Wind Rises, the Italian Caproni? When Caproni first built the seaplane, he worked with his older brother and two shipwrights. No one else was involved. So that means they were able to build it without getting any help from airplane experts. Curtis R3C0, on the other hand, it's not a seaplane, it's a float plane. It's a plane with a float. So, as long as it floats on the water, you don't have to think much about the strength of the plane itself. Whereas this seaplane must withstand the water pressure with the lower part of its body. So, it's basically very strong. 
And it's usually very heavy as well. On top of that, Porco's plane has a bad engine. And other than that, take a look at this. It has swept back wings. And as you can see by looking at Curtis's R3C0 aircraft in this era mostly had straight wing. It's easier to generate lift when the wings are straight. That was the norm in this era, whereas Porco's plane has backswept wings like this, as if he belonged to the post-World War II period. Plus, it's a monoplane, not a biplane, because he needs to speed up. Compared to Curtis's R3C0, the wings are a lot bigger, although these two aircrafts belong to the same size category. It's heavy and slow to take off. There's a scene where Porco struggles to take off after the plane has been modified in Milan. This is because of his own weight and the swept back wing, which makes it harder to control and fly the aircraft. It's just so hard to take off in this plane. When Porco's plane has finally taken off, Mama Yuto is already taking hostages. This is the scene. They're cute, aren't they? The kids look delighted. I've already talked for 45 minutes, but I'll go on. So, as you can see, there are no bad guys in this film. You won't see any real bad guys. The kids go, are we hostages? And they say, yes, you are. Kids say, are you air pirates? And they answer, you're so clever. So they almost look like good guys. But when you look closely, you can see a guy on the left with a rifle in his hand. So they are brutal, all right. But at least on the screen, you won't see anything brutal take place. So they seem like good people. The creator is saying, you can sit back and enjoy. This anime is for middle-aged men. It's not an assassin story like Gold Gold 13. Nobody's going to die and kids can enjoy it as well. So while Mama Yuto is taking hostages, Porco is... Here you go. Looking for the hijacked ship. He looks down at the sea searching for the ship. Here are the three cuts of him looking down. Take a look at this horizontal tail. It's hard to spot, but if you look carefully, there's a rudder at the back of it, right here. We call this rudder the elevator. If it points up, the plane ascends, and if it points down, it descends. To be more precise, if it points up, the nose points up, and if it points down, the nose points down. Sometimes people can be very fussy about aircraft, so I must be precise. This is the elevator. The elevator keeps moving, but in this scene, the elevator is constantly sliding sideways, like this. A plane is not steady while it's flying in the air. This is the scene where Porco is swaying and sliding to the side. So riding on a small plane is like this. It is almost like being on a swing, swinging from side to side. The elevator of the horizontal tail in the background is also constantly moving. When you maneuver an aircraft, you have to keep steering all the time in order to keep the same altitude. It's kind of awkward. By the way, I magnified one of the cuts in this scene. Well, it could have been other scenes, but I chose this one and magnified it. What's impressive is the fact that Miyazaki was able to come up with this composition with this subject of the pilot on the plane. It is extremely unique if you are studying to become an illustrator or a cartoonist. Or even if you are already working as one, watch the DVD once again, print out this cut and trace it. It is okay to trace an anime if it's only for yourself. Stop the DVD, print out the screen, and trace it. I'll tell you why. First, you can recognize the nose of the plane by the curve and the position of this line. The basic perspective in the foreground consists of engine, main wing, and the stay, which is this pole. 
And if you add a line here like this, you can place Porco's head anywhere you want. No matter where you place this short neck of Porco's, whether it's looking to the left or back, it works perfectly well. And the position of the tail wing is perfect. Usually, when the subject is looking around, the audience would automatically focus on the face. But in this case, you are able to see the tail wing moving in the background because it is beautifully placed within the audience's view. But you know, I wouldn't even say that this is the best composition of all the cuts in the film. What is so surprising is that there are tens and hundreds more of these kind of drawings that are drawn equally well. Illustrators, please stop the DVD at each scene and look at the details and try to analyze. What is this line doing here? Or, ah, the reason why the composition is so good is because the desktop here is balanced by the ladder here. There are many things to learn. I personally thought this cut was the best, so I printed it out. You know, you can learn so much about composition right here. Oh, my throat is getting sore. Okay, so the free lecture ends here. Subscribers only hereafter. I think Porco Rosso is so interesting to talk about that you should consider subscribing for these two weeks at least. And please hand in your questionnaire. The next part will be for nerds, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Uh, okay, so I've only talked about the first three minutes of the film. Okay, so let's see the results. The next lecture will be in more minute detail. Now let's switch. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous otaku king in Japan, otaku king Toshio Okada. I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese, so please look forward to it. If you ask a, com a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies. So please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.